Thank you. So you, well, you guys already are seated, so y'all don't have to say that. So as part of our summer series, we've been practicing saying some true statements to each other. So for this morning, I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, we are better together. We are better together. Great. Now you're going to turn to your other neighbor. You're going to say, other neighbor, other neighbor. I am your companion, not your competitor. I am your companion, not your competitor. Now we're going to do something new. You're going to turn to yourself and say, self, self, I will choose to connect and not compare. I will choose to connect and not compare. Thank you. <laughs> Did a great job. Over the course of our time in this series of Better Together, we've been reminded of the various types of relationships that cause human flourishing as God designed them to be. Today, we have the honor of rehearsing the covenant relationship between Ruth and Naomi. Covenant relators express and model God's love for us. Covenant relationships give us sight when we hold on to the hand beside us. But before we get there, I have a story to tell you, and it is one that I don't really even know where to begin with it. It's a little like asking a 10-year-old kid who's grown up in the church their whole life when they came to know Jesus, because they don't really ever know when to identify that. Um, so I can't identify that start because it's ever-growing and deepening. So I've been on staff here at CF since I was 26 years old, which was before I was in any covenant relationships like we're going to discuss today. If you would have asked me then what a covenant relationship was, I would have told you it was about marriage. And as a single person in the Midwest, you are well aware of the lack in your life when you are without the holy grail of relationships, marriage. I was in leadership ministry and unmarried, and in that arena, I was thrust into a stage of yearning for people I hadn't yet entered into covenant relationship with. It was in this stage that I was fully aware of my need for other people in my life. For this incredibly independent, free as a bird, world traveling 20 something, this was a bit like a dirty little secret that I actually needed other people in my life. Being self-made, self-sufficient, and hardworking to get what you want ethic was the waters I was formed in. And I dare say it is the waters many of us have been formed in. For what I'm about to share with you is so countercultural to the relationships we find in our society. Covenant relationships that are not in the context of marriage, are they possible? What are they and why do I need them in my life? And how do I get them if I'm supposed to have them? Well, back to my story. I have a friend that I'd like to tell you about. I met them when their child would scream so loud I could hear them from any point in our other church building. That was my cue as children's ministry director to go check out the scene. Often I was met there at the door with a smiling and just really loud child. Then I met this particular parent's many other children and teenagers, and I was confused. Wait, how old is this mother? Wait, who is this woman? So I invited her to lunch to get to know her and find out how the church could partner with her family in their ministry to the children in their care. Soon after that, their life situation changed, and I could tell that she was struggling internally. So I called her. Then she would begin calling me, and we'd talk, and sometimes laugh, and a lot of times cry. Pain of life and the weight of it was quite literally unbearable. And for one person alone, even more. Years later, when Jason and I got married, I knew everyone, according to him, and, and he knew no one, 
but this lady and her husband warmly welcomed my new to the community husband so warmly. But it was when we were in the trenches of infertility, year after year, I had no idea who to talk to or that it was even okay to talk about that she was there. My mental health and relationships suffered. You see, half the people in my life were having babies, and I was the one tasked with giving them a warm welcome in the midst of my grief and loss. This was pain compounded for me when it should have been the most joyous occasion. Keeping that hidden felt like a duty. Staying on course felt cruel from the God I loved and served. But this friend saw my pain. She stood with me in the thick of it, sat with me in my loss upon losses, and listened when I had only tears. Then she checked in the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that, until the clouds dissipated and light could enter my soul once again. During all that, we served alongside each other so many years in CF Kids with an ear to hear the needs and celebrations to willingly participate in whatever we are facing in life together. She has encouraged me in my deepest doubts of my calling, my worth, myself, and my confidence as a parent, and so much more. In fact, we've been able to do that for one another, and that is the secret sauce of covenant relationship. By now, if you don't already know the person I'm describing, it's this woman beside me. Joe, would you tell us more about covenant relationship? So let's take a moment and define covenant relationships. First, as the two separate words, and then as a unified concept. So I want to start with the word covenant. Often, covenant is translated to mean something along the lines of contract. The Lexham Bible Dictionary states that in application, contracts are limited by the terms of the exchange of property, like this is yours and that is mine, while covenants involve an exchange of life. I am yours and you are mine, which covers a virtually unlimited range of human relations and duties. Now, in terms of motivation, contracts are based on profit and self-interest, while covenants call for self-giving loyalty and sacrificial love. So, today, let's define covenant as a sacred agreement between two parties that specifies the sacrificial giving of at least one party to another. Now, relationship is somewhat easier and more difficult to define because it's a word that we are all so familiar with. Relationship is in everything, from the nutrients shared between my basil and tomato plants to the bond I share with my children. I looked for a definition, uh, but the result came back as one of those that I hated while I was in school. The state of being related or interrelated. So, for its purposes today, I want to take those to definitions and go deeper to the relationships defined by loyalty, steadfastness, and love. Relationship like what Kaylin and I share, in which the relationship is cultivated through riches of giving of oneself. When we put those two together, we get something that reminds me of what Jesus spoke about in John 15, 12 through 13. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So we'll define covenant relationships as loyal, steadfast love based on a covenant. So marriage is the first relationship that comes to mind when I think about covenant relationships. A secret agreement, two parties, loyalty, steadfast love, all the things are there. And I have been married for 16 years and can attest to the richness in my life because of that relationship. But it is too limiting to label marriage as the only covenant relationship. Aside from my marriage, I can count two other covenant relationships in my life. And honestly, I think I am rich to have that many. My sister Tiffany and I met at college. And no, it was not a parent trap situation where we met our secret sister at camp. Instead, it was a slow building of a friendship 
to the depth that we have long stopped thinking of each other as friends. We are family. We started calling each other sister early on because several of our professors at college continuously confused us for each other. And when one professor asked if we were sisters, we just went with it. <laughs> there were a few of us in the early years who called each other family. We needed to form quick and close bonds being so far away from home. Yet when trials, disease, and death came our way, it was only as sisters who steadfastly stayed for each other while we slogged through the mud. I have so many stories of the life we have shared together over the past two decades, full of joy and sorrow. It was when Tiff called me last May that we were both reminded of the depth of our relationship. You see, her two-year-old daughter had just been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And Tiff is the emotional and practical support of her and her husband's families. My response was to pull up a travel website and book a ticket to Washington, D.C. for when the baby began treatment. My sister later told me she wanted to say no because I have my own busy life here. She didn't want to be a burden, but she needed me. She needed the person who was for her, no matter what. So I went to DC and I cared for my sister while she cared for everyone else. I reminded her she is loved and joy can be found during storms. It is through covenant relationships that we have been invited to model God's love to others. In both Kaylin and my stories of covenant relationship, there is both sacrifice, I am giving myself to you, as well as humility, I am trusting you with me. I love that definition of covenant relationship that you gave about the sacrifice agreement between two parties. This idea of a sacred, holy, and set-apart agreement in the context of relationship with one another is so beautiful. So now we get to see this play out in scripture. Before we get into the story of Naomi, let's be reminded of the context the book is set in. If the book of Ruth is new to you, then Judges is also likely new to you. And what is important for all of us is to understand that the book of Ruth is set in contrast to the book of Judges, where we see the Israelites' fickle dedication to the God of Israel. We read of people like Gideon, Athenial and Deborah and Barak, Samson and others who are outliers in remaining loyal to the Lord. Often we must strain our eyes to see the remnant of love for God and his instruction and his I am presence. However, what precedes this story and surrounds this book of Ruth is the substance of deserters, traitors, and idolaters. We see the Lord God pleading with his people to remain in the covenant relationship with him as a nation. We are constantly reminded of the type of failures and missteps the Israelites make and that they had no king and everyone did as he saw fit. Judges 21:25. I would encourage you to read this book of Judges and Ruth together. As I read the book of Judges, I get this sense that we aren't that far removed from this society in our present day as we await the return of Jesus upon this earth. Just to recap the story of Naomi, in Bethlehem, known as the house of bread, there was no bread because there was famine in the land. Because of this, Elimelech, who's Naomi's husband, and his family go to Moab, Ironically, the people that refused to give bread to the Israelites during the Exodus. It's a matter of survival, you see. In this Exodus from Bethlehem, Naomi and Elimelech are in search of provision for their family and go to this foreign land about 10 days' journey away. While they were in Moab, Elimelech dies. And fortunate for Naomi, her two sons survive but only for another 10 years. Upon their death and her destitute state, she discovers hope and good news and announces to her grieving 
Moabite daughter-in-laws, that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So they all got ready, left, and began on the journey to Naomi's homeland, Bethlehem. Along the journey back, Naomi, out of concern for her daughter's well-being and her lack of ability to provide for their security and needs, commands them to go back to their mother's homes to hopefully marry again. In those days, the only way for women to be able to have their basic needs met was through a provision of a male. Whether it be a father or a husband or relative of one of those relationships or a slave master who is male as well. And on this journey, Naomi had a lot of time to think about this disadvantage. This is a matter of survival. Eventually, Orpah decides to return, but Ruth stays. Let's read this powerful exchange between these two women in Ruth. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, Why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Grief and disillusionment are powerful forces in the mind of a person. When humans lose what is near and dear to them, we often are overwhelmed. With thoughts and emotions, guilt, numbness, anger, grief, and disillusionment are part of these times in our human experience. I actually wonder how common of a human experience this is for those of us in this room. Have there been times in your life when you have experienced grief or disillusionment? With a show of hands, how many of you are there here who have shared this type of experience? Now, before you lower your hands, (laughs) look around the room and make eye contact with one other human in this room. Yeah. So our sympathy and our empathies are high for this woman, Naomi. Her losses were compounded upon one another, and she is now bitter to the point of changing her name and sending those who love her and are committed to loving her, no matter the cost, away. Leave me alone and turn back. I'm so disillusioned right now that all I can understand is loss. And of course that must mean you, my daughter, must go as well. Pain. Pain makes us do stupid stuff. It changes our vision, and often through the tears, the aches, the pain, the searing sadness, we cannot see the beauty of those in front of us, those who surround us, and those whom God has put in this shared life for the journey together. 
Pain will blind us when we let go of the hand beside us. Pain will cause us to slam the door and shout curses at the people and God we love in the good times. And yet, in the pain and grief, there is this presence that will never leave us or forsake us. The kind of love presence that sticks closer than a brother. It is from that relationship with the God Almighty who lowered himself as a servant to the hurting and broken that we can even conceive of a love that moves forward through pain. Covenant relators express and model for us God's love for us. Covenant relationships will give us sight when we hold on to the hand beside us. So Ruth had a front row seat to the pain and grief Naomi was experiencing, not just as a bystander. Ruth had a loss that intertwined with Naomi's sorrow. In Ruth 1.10, we see that both daughters-in-law are prepared to stay with Naomi. It was not until Naomi strongly urged them to return home that Orpah made the decision to go back to her mother. This was not a decision made lightly. And I say this to express that Orpah was not weak of character or fickle of mind. The tradition of this time, as we heard, was for women to be under the care of their male relatives. A widow returned to the home of their father or the home of their sons. And Orpah and Ruth had to have understood this tradition in returning to Bethlehem with Naomi. Orpah made her decision to return home after being impressed upon by her mother-in-law. Conversely, in Ruth, we see a woman who was led to go beyond the norm. So I want to take some time so we can get to know Ruth. Now, I have had the joy of naming three children. As a matter of fact, before we were even engaged, my husband and I had already decided on the names that we wanted for children that we were going to have. And I always wanted their names to have some kind of meaning. So after having two boys with two strong names and the equally strong personalities that complemented these names, we were excited to be able to use the girl names that we had chosen. Naomi, meaning pleasant. When we look at the meaning of the name Ruth, the Hebrew meaning comes back to us as companion, friend, or compassionate friend. She was known as a loyal, compassionate friend throughout that land. And Boaz says in Ruth 3.11, that for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. So let's look at the character of Ruth and what that brings to our story. Ruth was a woman of marrying age. We know that because of the urging of Naomi for her and Orpah to return home multiple times. In following Naomi, Ruth gave up the prospect of a comfortable life. With no male to speak for them, these women would have been living at the mercy of those around them. So even so, in Ruth 2.2, Ruth took it upon herself to go out and make the best of the situation for her and Naomi. So in the custom of that time and region, harvesters were to leave any of the harvest that fell out of their hands on the ground so that the poor could come behind them and pick up what was left. And Ruth went out to the field that day to bring back food for herself and her mother-in-law. And in doing so, she was showing an unwavering desire to do what was best for Naomi. Here she is saying to Naomi, you are mine. Now, this is where things get wild. In Ruth 3.1, Naomi declares that she must find a home for Ruth. And a lot of us know the story, but for those of you that don't, it went something like this. Okay. So Naomi looks at Ruth and she's like, I got a plan. You've been at Boaz's field for a bit and he's been showing you some attention, nothing crazy, but since he is my husband's relative, he can help us out. So here's what I need you to do. Tonight, it's a big gathering at his house, and you're going to go, but you're going to observe in the background while everyone is eating and drinking. But be sure to pay attention to where Boaz goes to sleep. When you're sure the man's asleep, I want you to go over, uncover his feet, and lay down. Y'all, this was scandalous. (laughs) 
no matter, that has been translated a few different ways, and each way is scandalous. So Naomi basically just told this woman, you're, you're going to go and possibly become more of an outcast in society. And Ruth said yes. No questions asked. She was telling Naomi, I am yours. We see in the character of Ruth, loyalty, respect, perseverance, trust, and love. Naomi was so certain that God had forsaken her. But Ruth became an example of God's love in Naomi's life. That even during incredible pain, she would be cared for and have care to give to another. Personally, I love to look back on these stories of our lives, as well as the lives of those in the lineage of Christ, and just marvel. Naomi and Ruth likely had very little understanding of the significance of their role. God was actively knitting them in the family line of David, who God made a covenant with personally. This Davidic Davidic covenant was to provide a king, a Messiah for the Israelites. This is the same king and Messiah that would rule forever and is our Savior, Jesus. Jesus is the descendant of Ruth and Boaz. Their child is the grandfather of David, the king of Israel, who had a heart after God. It is often difficult to see God's work in our lives in the thick of it. And unless, of course, we have remembrancers in our lives, like Miriam and Steve spoke about last week, Boaz likely had more clarity about his connection as a kinsman redeemer for these women and the family line. He would have had the privilege of holding the sacred word of God and reading the instruction of God to his people in the assembly. But it isn't until many generations have passed that the beauty of this story is written down. It was the gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness God that invited them in, right in the middle of tragedy and survival. It was their willingness and tenacity, perseverance and togetherness, their covenant love for one another that carved out this space in tandem with the Lord. This covenant fulfillment that goes to great lengths to include the foreigner, the empty-handed, the destitute, the widow, the orphan, the refugee, the starving, the homeless, to become part of the bloodline of the Messiah. It is in this partnership with the provider Boaz, who isn't even the number one pick, that the plot thickens. And we see once again that covenant relationship makes a way for a re-beginning, a second And third chance, covenant relationship is an invitation to deep waters of loving kindness and commitment. We often fear this, are desperate to receive this, and often are dying to give it away. As I started to really dig into this book, I came to realize there was something different about the covenant that Ruth made. So though the covenants of that time were not the same as our term contract, there was still an exchange being made, an expectation of fulfillment between two parties. God's name could be included in the covenant to give the illusion of a stronger binding, but God was not necessarily a part of the covenant. So in the case of Ruth and Naomi, a beautiful thing happened where Ruth made a covenant and Naomi came to reciprocate. But that was not the goal for Ruth. She did not declare this covenant to Naomi with the stipulation that she would be found a home and a new husband and safety and a family. Just the opposite. In fact, as we have seen, she made her covenant with the understanding that the return on her investment of herself would not come back equal or better. She gave herself for nothing in return. And then this began to sound familiar as I asked the question, who would do that? Who would sacrifice a future, a life, comfort for the sake of others? 
especially knowing that the return of that commitment would be less than what is being given. Can you see the foreshadow? Y'all, this is about Jesus. See, you see, we are invited into that covenant relationship with God. We are invited to humbly accept the loyal and steadfast love that is being offered through the sacrifice of his life. Covenant relationships are an opportunity for us to model God's love to others. Now, not all relationships are meant to be covenant relationships. Not all covenant relationships look the same. Some will be found in marriage. Some will look like what my sister and I have, where each party says to each other, I am yours and you are mine. There is a a give, give from each party. A commitment to each other to always be for each other's best, even through the muck. So, a while back, Bess gave us a definition of humility as trusting yourself with God and others. And we saw Naomi do this after Ruth declared herself. She said nothing more. And they continued on their journey. In that moment, she had to have had the humility to accept the love and loyalty that was being offered. And this is the hardest part for me. Saying yes when someone said they want to be in life with me. Not just the parts I feel comfortable sharing, but all of it. I love being that person for others, but I have learned that not all people are meant to receive you with open hands, saying, give me more of you. Give me all of you. I learned that I am a lot, and they didn't want all of me. Again, not all relationships are supposed to be covenant relationships. It was in 2015 that I knew my relationship with Kaylin was going to be different. We had already been great friends at this point and were doing ministry and church together. As she shared earlier, she was walking through a hard season of infertility, and though we had two boys naturally already, I was experiencing um, my own sorrowful infertility for two years as we were trying for another baby. Then in February of 2015, I found out that I was pregnant. As you can imagine, I was ecstatic, but I was also afraid. Was this going to be the beginning of the end for Kaylin and me? Would sharing this part of me finally be too much? I remember calling her to tell her I was expecting. Um, It was a short conversation, but I had to trust her with all of me, otherwise I would be disrespecting her. Little did I know that she was experiencing some of the same emotions. She called me three days later to express that she didn't want to lose the bond that we had. So many of our friends have had life changes and the season took them to another place. And she, like me, had always been happy for these friends. But this was different. She was telling me this was different. She still wanted all of me all my joys, all my sorrows. Oh, how I was humbled to be loved with such open hands and sacrifice. That day she invited me to experience God's love for being me, being expressed through another. So as we come to a point of reflecting and closing, I want to call us to express and model God's steadfast love for one another. Covenant relationships will give us sight when we hold on to the hand beside us. Who in your life do you have or long for a type of this relationship with? Is there a particular person that God has put in your heart and life that you need to humble yourself to receive them with loyal, kind, and steadfast love? Well, if you're sitting there today dismissing yourself out of covenant relationships, you need to hear something. You are in the thick of life right now. You have opportunity at this moment to go deeper in this life, and it may require something of you that you possibly don't have to give at this point. 
It may be a love that you are going to have to receive before you can give it. It may be something that comes from you as a spiritual sacrifice, as an offering of worship. I say that not to discourage you, but to compel you to pray with one another.